you are enjoying uh, this summer school. Uh, today's already third day, the time, time flies. I'm Sun Wan, and I'm going to talk about uh, measurement induced uh, phase transitions <coughs> in monitored quantum circuits. Before we start, I would like to you know, provide some context of you know, how these things are moving, how, how this field is moving. So, <coughs> so that's item number zero, introduction. <coughs> so we all know out of equilibrium quantum dynamics is extremely rich. And already, you know, past two days, we talked about many concepts. And one concept is the idea about how to combine close quantum dynamics, quantum many body dynamics, to the statistical mechanics, which means we need to understand quantum system thermalization, the quantum thermalization. Another, another you know, key words that we've been like, hearing from this school is quantum chaos, how to understand chaos, which is uh, one mechanism of uh, explaining thermalization, and it's closely related to the ergodicity. So this is <clears throat> what we believe that it has to happen in quantum systems without proof, but we are trying to understand what's going on. At the same time, we are interested in when these phenomena do not happen, so exceptions to this system. And that's the, basically what uh, Norm was emphasizing a lot, or God is breaking in a particular form or entirely. <clears throat> so it is very nice, and then uh, there are many, many topics to come over the uh, next many days. <clears throat> it's very nice, however, there's a big problem. The pr big problem is, this problem is extremely difficult. Relative to understanding conventional condensed matter systems, we have a well-established many advanced theoretical tools, field theoretic tools, diagrammatic tools, numerical tools. The physics that we are talking about here, we are at the very uh, early stage of the theoretical development. So as you might have guessed, uh, for example, quantum chaos and ergodicity, when Anatoly Pokovinov gave a talk, many of his slides contains exact diagonalization of quantum system made out of maybe 20 qubits, 20 to spin one half particles. 20 is a large number when it comes to simulating quantum many body dynamics, but certainly this is not a macroscopic number that we deal with as a quantum many, the real quantum materials. And that actually demonstrates how difficult this problem is. We are basically doing the brute force calculation. It's hard to go you know, beyond that. Therefore, the core community is trying to develop new theoretical tool sets to understand this narrow equilibrium dynamics. And one of the most exciting and rapidly developing tool is quantum information. So originally quantum information theory or quantum information science is motivated by the idea of, okay, can we control many degrees of quantum system in an arbitrary fashion so that we can do interesting, we can build interesting applications like building a computers, quantum computers, or building sensors, simulators, or maybe we can use it for secure communications. At the same time, we have developed an understanding of you know, what, what are the important in ingredients to design these quantum applications. And we all heard about entanglement entropy at some point in our study. That's one of the most important concepts. Tesla network methods, that's another important concept. Uh, quantum circuit, that's another important concept. Quantum channel, another important concept. Those words and those concepts are actively being studied in quantum information. And therefore, it's natural to adapt this quantum information theory as a tool to characterize what's going on. And one of the important concepts developed in quantum information field is notion of quantum circuit, particularly random unitary quantum circuit, because it's a good toy model to study in the, in the field of quantum information. But at the same time, this random unitary circuit is providing a good intuition behind what's going on in terms of physical messages. <clears throat> so this quantum information as a tool, basically we talked about two, two, uh, two branch. One is what I just described, the conceptual development, and the other one is also, separately, experimental events. So 
separate to the theoretical developments, we do have control over quantum systems. Some of them we believe to be some, system, uh, some scale that's beyond what we can numerically simulate using our classical computers. And those systems just started, like maybe within the past five or ten years, uh, five years, they just started providing the data whether uh, where otherwise it's difficult to or like, impossible to obtain. And just analyzing this data, we are, we are building more intuition about non-equilibrium dynamics. At the same time, in order to try to analyze the data, we are forcing ourselves to develop better theoretical description, which turns out to be a useful uh, you know, tool to understand you know, some of the many non-equilibrium dynamics. And not so surprisingly, many times whenever we introduce new tool or new experiment, we happen to have discovered like new phenomena. You discover it. <clears throat> and it's all cycle. Like we, we, we develop new physical phenomena that we have never imagined. Sometimes just because we didn't have enough tool set, or sometimes just because we have never thought about such a situation, it's out of our imagination. But now that things are coming into reality, we think about more exotic situations, or maybe not so exotic, but just didn't even have a chance to think about it and then discover new phenomena in these new settings. And this is going to be what we are going to talk about today, this lecture. The measurement-induced phase transition is a particular example where we are using quantum information tool to understand the out of equilibrium quantum antibody dynamics. And at the same time, we just realize that, okay, there's a rich phenomena that we have never imagined to exist, uh, but it seems to exist. And that's what we are going to talk about today. So <clears throat> first part of my lecture would be introducing uh, measurement-induced uh, phase transitions. Our objective of these lectures is twofold. The first one is to introduce this concept of measurement-induced phase transition so that you guys can jump into the research field. But this will remain at the conceptual level, at usually high level, providing as much intuition as possible, uh, what are the difficulties uh, in the field, and how the how field is moving. Another one that I wish I can deliver successfully is introduce technical tool, namely analytical tool associated with random unitary circuit. I hope my time management is successful, but if everything is successful, I'm going to talk about the first aspect in my first lecture, and the second aspect in my second lecture, and the goal of the second part is so that, you, okay, you learn about these technical tools and use it for your own research. It doesn't have to be measurement in this phase transition. No matter what the topic is, it could be just quantum information, like project itself, somehow utilizes technical tools because it's a so cool and nice tools that has been developed in quantum information community past few years. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's get started. The random unitary circuit. So we'll learn this random unitary circuit uh, uh, provides a new class of collective phenomena. Also, we'll learn this gives us a way to study the dynamics of quantum information. And we'll see that some of the aspects we are going to talk about it's in some sense a little more active than passive. So in the past, we talked about ergodicity breaking or the quantum chaos. By studying the dynamics of unitary systems or dissipative driven systems. But here, we are introducing the notion of measurement. And the measurement is special because you not only disrupt the wave function of the system, but we also gain information about the system through this measurement. Therefore, Somehow, it's more like with a quote-unquote 
interactive dynamics. And we'll see as a special example of a phenomena that occurs in this case, we'll see measurement in this phase transition. So at the level, at this point, this will be a little bit like too high level um, and qualitative, but hopefully it'll become very uh, solid soon. Okay. Measurement induced phase transition. So let's jump into the settings. <clears throat> what we are going to consider is a unitary dynamics generated by random unitary circuit. So just for the concreteness, let's consider having an array of qubit degrees of freedom. So qubit is just a two-level system. You can think of it as spin one-half particle up and down, but I'm going to use a notation that's more familiar in quantum information, like things zero and one. This line, you can think of it as a word line, so time is going up. Sometimes I'll go time from left to the right, but now in this diagram it's moving up. And we have a many qubits, in initial zero state. It doesn't have to be, but I just chose a particular state that's easy to write down. And I consider applying a unitary rotation, but this unitary rotation is acting on, for example, the first two qubits. So say U1 on the first two qubits. And unitary U2 to the, second, the third and fourth qubit. I could apply it to another unitary here, but let me just skip it. <clears throat> so this defines one time step of unitary evolution. You know, they are supported on different qubits, so we can apply the same, you know, like uh, these two unitaries like uh, <clears throat> simultaneously. When I say U random unitary, what I mean is this U is a randomly chosen element but once I choose, that's just deterministically chosen. So I'm not going to consider non-unitary dynamics at this point, just the particular unitary, but I just choose randomly from all possible unitary, uh, for example, unitary group, well, let's say SU4. This is going to be a four by four matrix because it's acting on four dimensional Hilbert space, but otherwise it's just randomly chosen. And this is independently randomly chosen, and there's no correlation between those two. Okay? So this defines one layer of unitary. And then we'll apply another layer of unitary. Now, let's actually work on these two guys and these two guys. So after applying this unitary, all qubits are feeling each other because they, are, they can be entangled through this unitary. Yes, question? It doesn't have to be, I'm just drawing as an example for now. And I'll stick to that cases within this lecture. But it's already like, a, it's a very good point. You have a U3 and U4, and you can build up. So this is first layer, and this is a second layer, and this number of layer is sometimes called depth, the depth of the quantum circuit, okay? So we consider the dynamics, the many body dynamics of this type whenever there's a large depth or large number of qubits. You can put into the periodic boundary condition, but I'm not going to in today's lecture. We could have done that. It doesn't have to be 1D, we could have the 2D. Just stack them in a reasonable way so that all qubits are interacting with one another eventually uh, by particular geometry, okay? So this, very good point, but I'll answer that in a moment. <clears throat> any, any other questions? Yes? Uh, so, could you elaborate the question? Uh, yeah. Ah, 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 I see, I see, I see, I see. SU3 is for three-level system. SU4 is for the four-level system. If I have a pair of qubits, two-dimensional, two-dimensional, so we have a total of four states. Therefore, the two qubit is actually a four-dimensional system. Therefore, SU4 is a more general one. SU2 cross SU2 will be smaller than SU4 because of what, what it means is you apply one unitary here, one unitary here, however, not necessarily entangling. Good, 
Any other questions? Yeah. That's right. So when I say randomness, I should have provided more technical definition of what distribution of randomness are you talking about. That's going to be my second lecture, but just to answer that, I'm just considering for now uniform distribution. So what I mean by uniform distribution for this group is that a distribution such that if you do the change of variables by conjugating or multiplying by another group element, the distribution is invariant. And technically it's called a high measure. Cool. So why do we care about this random? This is called the random unitary circuit. Like random unitary circuit. The name is very descriptive, like random unitary and it's a circuit, so it's a random unitary circuit. But why? Why do we why do we care about this object? And there are pros, pros and cons. One of the reasons that we study this random unitary circuit, it's because it's very generic unitary dynamics. It's a generic dynamics. In other words, it's a feature list. Feature list means it doesn't have any particular structure because it's randomly chosen. And sometimes that's useful because we are not studying any particular feature coming from you know, some constraint or the structures or some, some special properties of these dynamics, but only by the features that's commonly shared by all possible instances of random unitary circuits. Okay. So what are those features? What are the features that shared by this? And that's locality. Locality and geometry. So here, I intentionally drew the diagram in 1D in nearest neighbor gate. And that's good because we can restrict the quantum dynamics to be over that time. And then maybe we'll learn universal or like you know ubiquitous properties when the interaction is local, like geometrically local. We could have decided to do something else, either two dimensions or this unitary acting on first qubit and some other qubit that far away. That's still fine. In quantum information community, that's also called local. It's so-called too local because it's acting only on two qubits, but geometrically non-local. Those are also part of a consideration. But today we'll focus on geometrically local circuits because in some sense that's more relevant for the uh, real world situation. Okay, so this locality and geometry is something that can be captured by random unitary. And then there was a question about why we choose random because Interestingly enough, if you choose randomly, we can solve this problem analytically. So we do have analytical tool. But this analytical tool only applies to the statistical properties, ensemble properties. We cannot talk about the quantum dynamics for individual instance of unitaries, but we can analyze the properties of average overall unitary or typical behaviors of unitary. So we can have an analytical tool for statistical property. On the other hand, we also have a downside of this random unitary. <coughs> the first downside that this is generic. Maybe too generic, it's a too featureless. Sometimes we want to study properties such as energy conservation and how system thermalizes to the effective temperature locally, say like quantum thermalization. Um, or we want to study how chaotic behavior or ergodic behavior emerges, namely how the, the, the dynamics is described by the effectively random matrix theory. In this case, this is already a random matrix. The fact that the system dynamics resembles the dynamics of random matrices, it's not interesting at all because it is, they are random matrices, right? So that means it's not useful to study the emergence of the random matrices because it's explicitly random. And energy conservation can be, cannot be studied. Therefore, it's hard to study, for example, energy diffusions <clears throat> or any, any hydrodynamics. Uh, so any non-trivial quantum thermalization is difficult to study. 
Although we do have a version of random unitary circuit, where instead of sampling U from entire SU4, we only subset from the subgroup of SU4, where they do respect a particular imposed symmetry. So for example, you want to see the particle number, you know, conservation symmetry. That is possible, and that has been uh, active, uh, that, that is still the, the active you know, area of research. However, energy conservation is somewhat special because energy, Hamiltonian is itself the driving the dynamics, which is also conserved. And those type of features cannot be studied in this case. And also, this does not have a no natural system where it realizes the random unitary system. So we could engineer uh, these unitary dynamics using our quantum computer. However, we don't believe this occurs naturally. And finally, the same point as analytic tool, we can only study statistical property. Statistical property. And individual instances cannot be studied, so we cannot separate out what is coming from the ensemble behavior versus like individual behavior. But up to this pros and cons, this random unitary circuit is a very nice tool that we can utilize. Under these dynamics, our wave function evolves, starting from some psi zero. In our case, we are choosing this to be zero to the power n, like n is a number of qubits. And then if you apply u1, you can apply u2, this is a unitary evolution all the way up to some ut, <clears throat> and this defines quantum state at time t. So sometimes, you know, it's not so important how do you measure time. Here I just index them by one, two, three, four, but we could have indexed that this whole layer is like t equal one, this whole layer could t equal two. So usually I'll use my intuition that my t now refers to the index, but actually the depth. <clears throat> because that's more intuitive. This is entirely unitary dynamics. So for a useful fact, if this T over N is much, much larger than one, so the depth of the circuit is way deeper than the width of the circuit, what we believe is this product of U, T, da, 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 U1, is approximately uh, unitary sample from the global random unitary. So you can think of this whole thing as random over SU 2 to the n. So this is global random unitary. So when I write this notation, this is a very, what I mean is, okay, it's not exactly, you know, typical random unitary from this group, but I just mean this is practically indistinguishable from global random unitary, as long as depth is very large. If depth gets larger and larger, it'll be more and more indistinguishable from SU2, 3N. Uh, okay. Yes? Uh, the That's right, that's right. Not all circuits are unitary to design, but if you build up circuits in you know, whatever the geometry where it's connected, and then the depth is sufficiently large, and they form a unitary T design. The T design is a technical term. Basically, it says it's indistinguishable from how random global unitary up to teeth moment. Yeah, but that T is that this T is different T. Yeah, it's just like jargon. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, that's right. But but you can you can define this whole thing. Okay, let's define this layer of u as like v1 and this layer of u to the v2, and let's write it as a v1 and v2. Okay. Yes. Yeah, this n large n is a number of qubits. Cool, so any questions on random unitary circuit? Yeah. That's right, that's right. Actually, two, two main reasons. A, I don't want any conservation law other than unitarity and locality, okay? 
So that, that's the only feature imposed. That's one reason. Second reason is if this is chosen random unitary, turns out we can use analytical calculations by averaging over random unitary. And we know particular distribution of random unitary, like it's a uniform distributions. You can utilize that for our favor to carry on the calculations for many interesting properties. And that's going to the main of the technical tool is going to be the main part of my lecture too. No, no, it's not. Like, it turns out if you use a uniform distribution, we can use uh, the, the well-developed representation theory tool, so-called the sure vial duality, and then calculation becomes simplified because you can adapt them. However, that's not the only random ensemble we can carry out the calculation. Even with some other ensemble, maybe we impose certain symmetry or certain structure. Generally, whenever there's a randomness and a well-defined distribution, so we can carry out the calculation. Calculation becomes more difficult, but in principle, this idea carries out. Yeah. Any other? Cool. So, in order to understand this measurement-induced phenomenon, like uh, entanglement uh, uh, phase transition, which I have not explained what it is. Uh, but we do need in additional ingredients, so I'm going to talk about that ingredient now, and that's measurement. Um, it's obvious, it's a measurement induced phase condition, so we need to talk about measurement. So this is nothing, something complicated, but something that we every, uh, everyone you know, have, must have learned in our undergraduate you know, quantum mechanics, or if some of you maybe have learned in your high school, maybe in middle school. So the measurement is literally performing measurement on these quantum circuits. And we learned that if you perform measurement, you, the wave function collapses, and then you know, if you measure repeatedly measure that you get the same outcomes, etc. Th that measurement is what I'm talking about here. But here I'm going to perform probabilistic measurement. So what I mean by that is each time step for every qubit. I'm going to do the following. So after time step one, so you just apply V1, a layer of unitaries. For each qubit, one qubit at a time, separately, I'm going to decide whether I'm going to perform measurements or not. So with the probability P, or to simplify our notation, let's say probability Q, with the probability Q, I perform measurements. And with the probability one minus Q, I do not perform measurements. Okay? So with Q, I perform measurements. And with probability one minus Q, no measurements. If I don't do any measurements, I just don't do it, the wave function is intact, nothing changes. The wave function stays as it is. Okay? However, with probability Q, I perform measurements. Whenever I perform measurements, it'll inevitably disrupt the wave function. Okay? So here, I'm going to assume that measurement is performed in the computational basis. It's zero, one basis. That means the measurement outcome is going to be either zero or one with a certain probability. Okay? So when perform measurement, now wave functions collapses to either of the two cases. When the measurement outcome m is equal to zero, we collapse the wave function so that that particular qubit becomes zero after the measurement. And then we obtain an unnormalized wave function, so say m equals zero, which is defined by, you project, so this is a projection operator acting on that particular qubit. Now apply to our wave function psi. <clears throat> and if I measure one, we will get unnormalized wave function m equal one, which is project to the unnormalized wave function like psi. Okay. And what is the probability of obtaining this particular measurement? And that's determined by norm of this uh, unnormalized measurement. So probability 
at m equals zero is the same as expectation value of the wave function before the measurement, projection to zero, so I just define this as a p zero, psi, let's say the p zero times identity, psi, so this is a measurement outcome, or this is the same as <coughs> psi tilde m equals zero, and psi tilde m equals zero. The norm of the wave function. So that's the probability that you get m equals zero. No, we are not changing this measurement rate q. Every, so here, this is we are talking about one particular measurement that could happen on the first qubit with the probability q. It may not happen. And then I do the same thing here with the probability q perform measurement or one minus q I don't measure. And whenever we perform measurement, you also collapse. Okay? So you collapse, potentially collapse here and also collapse here. May also collapse here. And maybe you don't you skip the measurement and so on. And do that for every qubit. And that's one layer of unitary, the measurement layer. Once you do that, you collapse the wave function, you obtain the wave function like this, and condition on particular measurement. Suppose for now we perform the measurement and obtain a particular measurement outcome m, and then this leads to the evolution where the psi maps to psi tilde of m. However, this is all normalized such a way that you know, the norm is a probability of getting a measurement outcome. So oftentimes what we are going to do, we just normalize it back. We just normalize and define psi of m by just literally normalizing them. Okay. However, however, what's implied is whenever we normalize them, we know that occurs only with a certain probability. So we also need to keep track of the probability of measuring that outcome. Okay. And then evolve further and further. And this is repeated for sufficiently many layers, like the layer T. The number of measurements we perform <coughs> also will also be the random variable because we decide on, you know, like randomly. Asymptotically, some fraction Q of the qubits will be measured if the system size is very large and the time, is, uh, time evolution is very you know, deep, the depth circuit. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. So here I'm performing measurement on one qubit. So the projection operator is acting on one qubit and then you're acting identity to the rest of the qubits. So when I say M, what I should really say is measurement outcome at a specific location, like the first qubit in this case, is equal to zero. If I perform measurement another time here, so you perform measurement here and here, and they obtain measurement outcome, you know, say zero and one here, and then I need to define my M such that it contains the information. For example, this will be, okay, the first qubit measures zero, and third qubit measures one, da, da, da. So over time, this notion of M will be a growing array, keeping track of which qubits are measured at what time, say, okay, so actually this should have been like another one, you know, time index, okay, T equal one, first qubit, zero, Know, t equal two, uh, the t equal one, third qubit one, and then you should keep track of when you perform the measurement and where you perform the measurement and what the measurement outcomes were. Okay? And then this m from now on, I'm going to use as a collective index that describe all those information in a, in a, in a symbolic manner, like it's a single m. Very good question. Any other question? That's right, there are, there is finite probability, actually that's like Q to the power of N, 
where you happen to perform measurement of all qubits on one particular layer. Maybe you're lucky or maybe not lucky. And then the wave function will collapse to a particular product, say 0, 1 bit strings. That could happen. However, whenever you choose reasonable Q, say half, like a 0.1, the probability of that event occurring is basically zero. Because we, on typical basis, we only measure certain fraction. But that's theoretically possible, yeah. Any other questions? Very good. So previously, our unitary dynamics uh, is evolved by this, that's literally unitary evolution, and you obtain the wave function at a later time. Now we obtain non-unitary dynamics. where the wave function is enumerated basically by M and also like set of unitary gate choices. It depends on the which unitary gate we choose at every layer. So because notation becomes complicated, I'm not going to write down this unitary too much. But we, we should keep that in mind that the wave function depends on a particular choice of unitary randomly chosen. And this is going to be some operator KM acting on our initial state. Let me put tilde out to indicate that I'm going to talk about unnormalized wave function. And here, M is this record of the all measurement outcomes. And KM is whatever the linear operator that we obtain. It's going to be the product of those unitaries and then these projection operators, and they multiply them and stack them over time. Okay, so that's going to be my definition of KM. Yeah. Yeah. You could apply multiple measurements for the same time, for the different qubits. For each qubit, we just decide whether it's measured or not by Q. Or you could have multiple measurements, yeah. Okay, and this all normalized wave function has a nice property. The one thing is if you compute the norm of the wave function, norm of this all normalized wave function uh, squared, in other words, to just inner product to itself, and that's actually probability of obtaining this all set of measurement outcomes. This is true for single one particular uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, particular measurement. However, this is also true collectively. If you collect many, many measurements, overall norm of this unnormalized wave function is actually uh, the probability, proportional to the probability of measuring that outcome set. So like between two scenario, can you say that again? Yeah, so That's right, so let me repeat the question. So we could imagine a situation where every time step, we just want to choose like one of the qubits and they perform measurements versus for each qubit, we perform measurement with the probability Q. Are they different or not? They are of course very different. On one case, on average, we have a certain fraction of qubits measured uh, if in the limit that n is very, very large. On other case, we do not measure the fraction, but you only measure one, at most one qubit. And the, like, in terms of many body physics, the effect of the measurement will be very minimum. Because you have a, like, imagine that you have a two to the 23 particles and measure one of them and nobody cares. But if you measure like fraction of them, and that's a substantial measurement. So measurement plays an important role in quantum dynamics. We are going to consider the letter, letter case yeah, where you measure a fraction of qubits. Okay? Hey, sorry? Yeah, yeah let's write it down. This KM. <coughs> KM is just defined by <coughs> unitary one, you know, I say V1 the first entire layer of unitary, 
And then we are going to have a you know, projection operator, projection operator to say mj, where the j measurement outcome uh, is equal to zero and one. This is the projection operators. And you just multiply them for j that's measured. So this is a projection operator for one time step. And then apply v2, second layer. And then we are going to multiply, you know, apply the projection operators to after the second layer, that's going to the product of P and again J. So maybe it's layer one, and layer two, and J in the measurement set, and so on. Because of this projection part, this KM is non unitary. M, and we have a like superscript one, that means it's layer one. What, what does, sorry, I just couldn't hear you, yeah. What's in the product uh, here? A J, so we are running over qubits that's measured. Measured, measured, measured. yeah. Because not everyone, not everything is measured, right? So we only enumerate the measured one. Okay, so like one of the kind of visual picture we have in mind is the following. So we start from some initial state, and then you evolve by some unit choice, say V1. But at some point, we perform measurement, and we you need to study like two different possibilities, measurement one and measurement two. In each case, you just also evolve by unitary. So this is like first measurement equals zero, first measurement equal to one. And then you also perform the second measurement. And then we have this bifurcating, you know, uh, these trajectories. So we have uh, many different trajectories of wave function. And each wave function is enumerated by unnormalized wave function, psi of m, or psi of m prime, dot, 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 like so, psi of m double prime, many different trajectories. And also, of course, a set of choice of unitaries. <clears throat> and we are going to consider this whole thing as an ensemble of pure state, a set of ensemble of pure states, either consider as an unnormalized wave function ensemble, or normalized wave function ensemble associated with the probability P of M, which is the same thing, because like, uh, you know, this is a norm of the wave function, this is just a normalized version of psi tilde. Okay? So let me make a one comment. This situation is slightly, and actually drastically different from the conventional out of equilibrium dynamics, the open system dynamics we usually consider uh, in physics. So in the usual physics, we usually talk about averaged over all these trajectories or ensembles. So we don't talk about ensemble of you know, pure states. We usually talk about or identify ensemble of pure states as if it's the same as a density matrix. For example, many cases, we define the density matrix as summing over all this measurement trajectory, the probability of M and psi M and psi m, which is the same as sum over m, km, psi zero, psi zero, and km. But generally, we could have talked about some generic mixed initial state, sum over m, operator km, rho zero, and km dagger. Rho zero is the initial density matrix. And this particular form of map from the density matrix to the final density matrix is generally called a quantum channel. <clears throat> it has to satisfy certain properties, namely the, if it, rho zero is normalized, say the trace is equal to one, the final one has to be trace equal to one. We know the eigenvalues of rho zero has to be all non-negative because it's associated with the probability distribution. The same has to be true. That means that it's a positivity, that you need to preserve the positivities. 
And also, we could consider this row zero as some mixed state, which is actually secretly entangled with some, you know, some other degrees of freedom. And even in that case, after applying this map, the final state also has to be a physical state. And if it satisfies all the relevant you know, physical constraints, it's called a completely positive trace-preserving map, the so-called CPTP map. And this expression is also called operator sum representation. And then this individual operator KM is, has a name, it's called the Krauss operator. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm introducing those terminologies so that we can connect to the conventional situations. Whenever we have a quantum channel, we can always rewrite in these operator sum representations for some choice of cross operators. And these cross operators have this, new, this index M which tells you what trajectory we are considering. While conventional case considers averaging over this different M or summing over different M. In our case, we are considering individual trajectories separately and we will consider the properties of them, uh, non especially the nonlinear properties of them uh, you know, average over probability m, the probability of pm. So that's going to be the overall, you know, you know the, the situation that we are going to talk about. So any questions so far? Very good, we are already halfway through the lecture, so let's actually explain what this measurement, this phenomena, uh, the entanglement phenomena is. <clears throat> Entanglement phase transition. So, so we are going to talk about entanglement entropy of the individual wave functions. So we consider random unitary circuits and probabilistic measurements and obtain an ensemble of wave functions enumerated by pro probability of M and associated normalized wave function. Now, take a particular instance, psi of m, and then there's going to be some kind of many-body wave functions. So I'm implicitly using tensor network diagrams. So these individual legs represent the different qubit degrees of freedom, and this is some wave function psi of m. I, I'm going to divide them into the two parts. Not exactly half and half, but let's say roughly half and half. So the last half, is what I call a subsystem A. And the other half is A bar, which is a complement of A. A bar. And then we'll quantify amount of quantum correlation between the left and the right for this particular pure state. And this quantum correlation can be characterized by so-called entanglement entropy. <clears throat> so entanglement entropy, the, uh, uh, the entanglement S of A of the subsystem A with the rest of the system for the wave function psi of m is defined as, well, we first define a density matrix, a reduced density matrix for this wave function by tracing out a bar from this wave function. So we get the wave function and trace out all the degrees of freedom on the a bar and get the reduced density matrix for a, and then talk about entropy minus trace of rho a log rho a. And of course, this rho depends on particular measurement set outcome m, and also choice of unitary, but I just suppressed the notation. This is entanglement entropy. So this sa is a function of this measurement outcome, and also all set of unitaries that we applied. What we are going to do is we'll average this entanglement over all possible realizations. 
So we will com compute average entanglement as a bar defined by, we start from as A that depends on the measurement outcomes and the choice of unitary first, and then multiply the probability of that measurement, you know, measuring that particular outcome, and sum over all M. So this is average entanglement, uh, averaged over different measurement outcomes. And then we are going to average over all ensemble of unitary gates that we could have applied stick to the particular geometry. So we average over this guy, average over this guy, because it's the independent random variables. So average over these unitaries. And then that's how we define the average entanglement of A. Is this clear? Okay. Yes? That's right, that's right. So we are given this diagram with a specific choice of use here and there. And then let's say we have a specific realization of measurement. Okay, you're here I perform measurement. Here I perform measurement. Here I perform measurement. And then we have a measurement outcome. Okay, M1 equals to one, M2 equals to two, uh, zero, you know, M3 equals to zero, and measurement outcome. And then we can talk about wave function uh, that obtain, you obtain as a consequence of this non-unitary dynamics. That's the psi of M. Just normalize, okay? So normalize, you normalize wave function because you normalize, and then do this geometric composition or do you reduce the density matrix, and then compute the entanglement entropy. Is PM, uh, this psi M, here? Yeah, this PM is a probability of obtaining psi M, uh, uh, yeah, probability of obtaining a psi M for a particular measurement outcome. This PM also depends on the choice of unitary, which I did not specify yet. Yeah. So here, we are averaging over all measurement outcomes, and then we are also averaging over different choice of unitary that you could have applied. They so doubly averaging, like two different averaging. Yes? Why it depends on the measurement? S is an entanglement entropy between the left half and the right half. So it's a, it depends on the wave function. And the wave function depends on the measurement outcome. M is a measurement outcome, yeah. M is, sorry, like, maybe it wasn't clear. Like M is a measurement, a collection of measurement outcomes at every space time when we perform measurements. Not by, sorry. Uh, it's not a product, it's just you, you sample different M, so you, this is perform measurement. You could either zero or one. So you're following this trajectory. The in, Yes? Yeah. It's not like that. So this wave function is some very complicated many body wave function. It's not a single qubit wave function, it's an n qubit wave function, unnormalized. It's obtained from this formula, but just one wave function. And this is a different wave function. Uh, and you know that they are enumerated by the records like M. Yes. Let's go. Let's talk about it later. Yes. That's right. For each wave function, each pure state wave function. We compute the entanglement entropy for the pure state wave function and then average over these trajectories. That's right. The different trajectory corresponds to different measurement outcomes.
Exactly, exactly, exactly. Exactly. Okay. All clear? Okay. This is rather unconventional because, as I said, the conventional picture is we obtain the ensemble wave function, the average the wave function first, and then obtain the mixed state, and then do evaluate the different quantities, okay, neutral information or some different types of entanglement. But here we are not doing that. It's just we are taking a rather unconventional route where we compute the entanglement of pure state first and then average over different uh, trajectories, uh, different measurement outcomes. Measurement out when I say trajectory, what I really mean is a trajectory of the measurement outcome. And surprising finding is that there exists a phase transition in the dynamics of SA bar. So if you plot this SA bar for sufficiently large systems, and A is uh, some large fraction, slightly less than one half, for example, I just divide into the half, like, like, you know, like one third and two thirds, or like 50 50. Sorry? That's right, yeah. That's right. <clears throat> so we obtain the psi m for the global wave function, and then divide the system into a and a bar. And then consider, you know, psi a bar as a function of this depth t. We could have done this calculation for the different depths of time. It's more and more complicated wave function, and time t, and the wave function s a bar. So what's going to happen? When time equals to zero, when you don't apply any unitary, and entanglement is zero, there's only one trajectory because we have not performed any measurements, right? So it's going to be starting here. Now, if you run the time evolution, you apply some layers of unitary. And then the systems get entangled one another, you know, from one part, so entangled from the other part. So entanglement will eventually somewhat develop. However, we also perform measurements. So the measurements actually destroy the entanglement because once it's measured, these qubits collapse to either zero and one. That means it's not entangled with any other degrees of freedom. So there's a little bit of competition. So if the measurement rate Q, this Q, the probability of performing measurement, this Q, is sufficiently high, higher than a particular threshold, QC. The entanglement entropy maybe develop a little bit, but the saturate to a certain value and then stay there in the steady state, at least on average when you perform measurement, you know, average over measurement. Particular trajectory will behave in a funky way. However, once on average, it behaves in this way, especially the typical behavior. On the other hand, when this measurement rate is less than a certain threshold, QC, entanglement actually grows and grows almost indefinitely until it saturates at a later point where the saturation value is actually limited by the system size. So some fraction alpha times n. This alpha is a number from 0 to 1. So basically, it's limited by the system size. So alpha could be one half, and that would be actually the case when you do not perform any measurements. If Q equals zero, the entanglement will develop almost indefinitely, and it will be almost maximally entangled. So the size of entanglement will be basically the size of the A. So you could even put you know, NA here. But I'm assuming NA is kind of some fraction of total system size, so I'm going to define accordingly. So alpha is some number, and saturate this, okay? And this is very distinct. Here and here, here we have an entanglement that scales with the volume of the subsystem. So in that case, we say it follows volume law scaling of entanglement entropy. So those are so-called volume law states. And here, the entanglement is kind of, you know, developed a little bit, but stays small. And this is order one quantity, like some constant number. Why? Because every time step, there is some probability of applying this unit, right? Depending on even or odd time step. And if you happen to not apply any measurements, there will be some entanglement across this boundary, right? 
So it may be zero, but it may not be zero. And basically, that's the picture. You have some local entanglement around the boundary, but not large scale of boundary. So this amount of entanglement here uh, scales with the boundary area of the subsystem. So we could say boundary row instead of volume law. But more conventional jargon in quantum information is so-called area law. This is very confusing because in one dimensional system, boundary is not area, but it's very confusing, but like, that's just jargon, so I'm sorry about that. We can just call it boundary law versus volume law or bulk law, but just convention in the, in the communities, we talk about volume law, let's say the size of the qubit and boundary area law to say the boundary area of the system. And the idea is this transition from one case to the other case occurs as a critical phenomenon, as a, as a quantum phase transition. So at the critical point, Q equals QC, we have an intermediate behavior, logarithmically scaling and kind of entropy, uh, scaling with the, the subsystem size. And then we have a diverging correlation length, for example, so and the critical behavior. And this phenomena is discovered, and that goes my, that's by name, measurement um, measurement induced entanglement phase transition. This is interesting because this is literally new critical phenomena in critical physics that occurs in the space of random unitary measurement. This interplay is very like, interesting. This is not coming from the equilibrium systems. Uh, this is occurring in the intrinsically dynamical systems. And quote unquote order parameter is not obvious because it's not a symmetry breaking phase transition as like, you know, Professor Norman Yao talked about. There's no symmetry that's broken because it's a generic random unitary. There's no structure. However, there's entanglement, you know, there's a entanglement entropy, which is an information theoretic quantity, but that undergoes a phase transition similar to the spontaneous symmetry breaking. So that's very exotic and very interesting. But at the same time, at the current moment, it's not exactly clear what's the physics behind this. What does it mean that entanglement entropy undergoes a phase transition? So I'm very sympathetic, like, and I kind of agree with you, but in, as a person, as a personal perspective. So maybe the intuition is this. Okay, the wave function initially is all zero, it's a product state. We know that's a small corner of the many body Hilbert space. Majority, actually, you know, almost entire wave function in the large two to the n dimensional Hilbert space is very highly entangled, right? So what it means is if you perform measurement very frequently, we are not exploring entire wave function, but only just scratching the surfaces, you know, just staying in the corner of the Hilbert space. From that sense, roughly speaking, okay, it, it seems like some organicity is broken. I agree with that picture. However, I have not seen kind of existing research along that line. So I think it'll be a very interesting research perspective, but I will say maybe we need to handle what it means by our, you know, ergodic in this exotic sense, because that notion, as far as I understand, has not been studied very carefully in, in these particular settings, right? In some sense, it's tricky because it's a random unitary, so random, it kind of ran, in some sense, randomness, emergence of kind of ergodicity that people could talk about, typical, you know, this, you know, random matrix theory, that, that conventional definition is hard to apply, or maybe we should modify some picture, but that's a very good question, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, 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 okay, okay. So, so I, I could just put uh, some alpha NA, but we know this NA is some fraction of N, right? So I just redefine alpha by alpha times F. So it's just some number from zero to one. That's what I mean. So I, I could just say this is like alpha tilde N, where alpha tilde is just alpha times F.
Ah, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. So let's let's talk about this alpha. So I'm so sorry. That's, this is alpha tilde, okay? In the ratio of n, if the measurement probability is zero, you don't measure anything, and then you will generate the wave function of this form. In the limit t is very large, at some point when t is very large, the saturation value, you will behave as if you are applying some global random unitary to the system. And then you get some typical wave function from the Mendy by Hilbert space. And you can actually prove that for typical wave functions, entanglement entropy of any bipartition is basically maximum. That means it's n over two. So in that limit, this value, this kind of, you can, you can perceive as like entanglement density, which is incorrect intuition, but because uh, I'm going to explain it in the next five minutes. But let's still call it entanglement density, and the density will be one half. Just because we are cutting into the half, like half and half. If this is not half and half, like one third and two thirds, and that alpha will be one third, just that means that at maximum. So this alpha will be one, because the entanglement entropy will be basically the size of the subsystem. Q equal one, zero case. But Q equal non-zero case, it'll be lower. And at some point, it'll not just develop volume, no, but stay area law. Yes. Yes. Ah, excellent question, yeah, but can I default the question? Because I want to have a proper discussion about that point. Yes? Okay, so, see. so this has a dynamical notion because it's a phase transition about how entanglement developed over time. However, it doesn't really need to have to define the characteristics of time because we can take the t going to very large and then consider a steady state for the finite size system, right? So one way to characterize this is just getting the slope. Okay, here the slope is zero, and here the slope, uh, slope, slope is not zero. So in the thermodynamic limit, n goes to infinity first, and then you will de develop indefinitely. That's one approach. Or choose n to be finite, and then take the time goes to infinity first, and then talk about the saturation value. I'm taking the second route. You go to the time infinity first before n goes to infinity, and then talk about saturation value, and compare how, what ratio to the total system size. Because we take time infinity first, we don't have to worry about you know, characteristic time scale. It's not universal. It's just some number. I don't even remember the number because it's not universal. It varies over like details. For example, like what ensemble unit you use, uh, or what geometry you use. You know, so if you you can introduce like next nearest neighbor unitary or like long range interaction unitary, the QC depends on a lot of different factors. Yeah. Logarithmic scaling. Yeah. Absolutely, like, so it, it looks like, so the question was, when Q equal QC, it has a signature of a continuous phase transition like typical to other universality class. So the natural question is, what is the universality class of this problem? We have signature that, that this universality class is a particular, uh, not a particular, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a non-unitary CFT. However, we cannot pinpoint which universality class it is. It's an open problem, and we want to understand that. And my second lecture will be basically on efforts to figure that out, even though it doesn't give us the answer. But, but it develops a pretty good intuitions, yes. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, this is perfect. And I want to open up one discussion about these things. Uh, let me just leave it at the here. Sorry? Okay. Yeah.
Yeah? It's not important. The randomness is not important. Okay. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, okay. Is this phenomena, does this phenomena require randomness? No. If you consider particular chaotic spin chain Hamiltonian dynamics and do basically just even continuous time evolution, but you randomly perform measurement spread over space time, I'm not sure whether the particular numerical simulation is done, but there's something similar has been done, and this phenomenology can be recovered. So this phenomenology does not depend on the randomness in the random unitary circuit. However, random unitary circuit will be useful because we can carry out the calculation. <clears throat> but I want to get into this, you know, number two, the non-local effect of measurement. In some sense, if you think about this, it's a very weird. And let me explain why it's weird. So intuitively, this random unitary circuit is entangling systems one another. So this is roughly speaking an entanglement production. On the other hand, this measurement is basically what destroys the entanglement, so entanglement destruction. And it's kind of natural that you have a competition, okay? So entanglement develops and then you just kill the entanglement by just performing measurements, and there's a competition. And whenever there's a competition, you could have a second order phase transition, a continuous phase transition, and critical behavior. So maybe not so surprising. But let's think a little bit further. Here we are talking about the steady state behavior. So at the steady state, on average over time, the coarse grain picture, the entanglement will not change. So average change in the entanglement across a certain cut will be zero. So I'm, I'm building up the arguments based on this intuition, and then I'll lead it to the contradiction. Okay? So the entanglement change will be zero. And this entanglement change is coming from the two factor, which is entanglement increase by random unitary circuit, and there's entanglement decrease by measurement, and they has to be equal, because this is a balanced in the steady states, okay? Roughly speaking, entanglement increase by random unitary circuit goes by following. If you cut this system into half, say, say this is A and this is A bar, we are talking about how entanglement entropy is developing due to the unitary evolution. If I apply any unitary like this guy, which is entirely supported within A bar, or within A, entanglement entropy does not develop because we are talking about correlation between across this cut, but not correlation among the, each subsystems. So the entanglement uh, entropy between A and A bar grows only through the unitary applied across the cut. In 1D, there's only one, this boundary area is, is order one. Therefore, per time, this entanglement growth is some order one constant number. In the d-dimensional system, it will be d, uh, you know, d minus one dimensional object only on the perimeter. So it's so-called area loss scaling behavior. Okay. However, if you perform measurement, we are completely disentangling those degrees of freedom from the circuit. So every time step in the thermodynamic limit, like, and it's very, very large, but finite. We measure some fraction of qubits, like Q times N, that's like substantial number. So, and after the measurement, those entanglements will complete, get completely uh, you know, disentangled from the rest of the system, okay? So if we use, for example, this entanglement density alpha tilde as a, as a, as a intuitive notion, entanglement reduction will be entanglement density, basically entanglement per particle times Q times N, which is, uh, or NA, which is a number of particles that's measured at each time step on average, okay? And because they are completely disentangled from the rest of the systems, we can imagine that entanglement reduction will be proportional to the density per particles, Q times NA, number of particles, okay? I'm explaining the wrong thing just to illustrate what goes wrong. 
So if we, what we want is this difference to be zero. What it means is, so each order wants some constant. So let's say it's a constant. What it means is alpha tilde would scale roughly some constant over Q times NA. Or in other words, like alpha star, uh, alpha tilde times NA scales as constant over Q. So what it means is unless Q is zero, this NK gamma has to be the order one independent of system size. So you can always have this area law entangling phase unless Q equals zero. So it could be large value, but strictly speaking, any finite Q, you should have finite or vanishing entanglement density or finite entanglement of the subsystem. This implies no volume of phase. But I want to put a question mark because, in fact, this is not true. No, we do see very strong signature from numerical simulations that this indeed happens. And also now we have a better like, theoretical descriptions of how to understand the volume of entanglement state. Okay? And that's associated with the subtle nature of non-local aspect of entanglement entropy. And I'll spend the rest of the 10 minutes just explaining what that means. So any questions uh, here? So the, the, let me tell you the conclusion. We should not treat entanglement entropy as if it's a local observable. It's not like energy density. It's not like charge density. It's not a local observable. It's an information theoretic content. It's an information theoretic quantity that characterizes amount of, amount of correlations. And also measurement is not a unitary operation. It's a, it's a non-local op, you know, operations. That, that alters a wave function in a very subtle way. And to illustrate that, I'll give you a specific example. So here, let's consider a quantum circuit diagram. So we are going to have three qubits. The first qubit is in a so-called plus state, which is a superposition of zero and one. Second qubit is also in the plus state, and the third qubit is also in the plus state. Okay. Yes, question? Of course, it's not observable. It's not a Hermitian observable, so it's not an observable in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the technical sense. Uh, you can see, you can, but you can ask, okay, so let's, it's, we are in the realm of research, right? So who cares about existing definition, right? Just modify the definition of observable. Like, can we say entanglement is kind of generalized observable? Uh, can, we, can we consider it, is it like a, as a plain language English, you know, is it observable? You can ask the question, right? I have personal opinion, and my opinion is no. However, you know, I'm not 100% sure, maybe 99% sure, but that's my personal opinion, but that's a very good research. In fact, that question um, is partially studied in computer science. So they ask about complexity, so computational complexity, but another thing is so-called sample complexity. So what is the number of repetition, number of measurements you need to do in order to estimate the amount of entanglement? In the worst case scenario, that's exponentially difficult in the value of entanglement, and that's a provable statement. So, now we are kind of entering the realm where you know, we need to talk about complexity. You know, so it's observable in principle, but if you only repeat exponentially many measurements, uh, maybe in some cases you have a smart choice. So it's not the worst case. So we, physicists deal usually about typical case better than the worst case. The typical case might be actually better than the worst case under certain structured case, but that's, I think, an excellent research project. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to consider a particular quantum circuit by applying so-called control Z gate. So it is a CZ gate. 
So what CZ gate does is the following. If this qubit is zero, I don't do anything here. But if this gate is one, I apply Z gate here. And it turns out that's the same as the other way around. If it's zero, I don't do anything or apply identity. If it's one, I apply Z gate, the poly Z gate. So that's the CZ gate. And I do the CZ gate here and then obtain the wave function. And this wave function is entangled between these two qubits due to this, uh, this gate. And also it's entangled between these two qubits because of this gate. So if you cut the system into part A and then complement A, A bar before measurement, SA is going to be log two. Or if you choose a log base two, it's just equal to one. That means there's one qubit and that qubit is entangled with the rest. So it's a maximum value for this minimum example, okay? Before measure, so we will talk about what happens we perform measurement. And specifically, we are going to measure this guy in the middle in the X basis. So what I mean by X basis is you can understand in two different ways. Apply the qubit rotation, so X becomes Z and then measure in Z basis, okay? But to simplify my argument, I just measure X basis. That means measurement outcome could be either plus or minus. Even though this start out plus state, because it's being entangled, locally, this wave function will look like maximally mixed state. Therefore, it's not obvious that you will get plus state because of the entanglement with the other one. In fact, we can easily show that probability of measuring plus and probability of measuring minus are equal, and that's a 50-50 for this particular circuit. Okay? And let's analyze what happens to the wave function to these systems. Okay? So let's do that. Before measurement, our wave function can be understood in this way. I'm going to divide into two cases, whether this is zero or whether this is one, okay? If it's zero, you don't apply here and you don't apply here. Therefore, the wave function is going to be plus on the first qubit and zero in the middle qubit and plus in the third qubit. If the middle one is one and then you apply Z gate, and if you apply poly Z, you flip the phase here, so this whole state becomes a minus state. <clears throat> and then you have a minus state for the first qubit, and one for the second qubit, a minus state for the third qubit. But we are starting from the superposition of those two branches. Therefore, your wave function will be superposition of these two branches. Okay? This is a wave function before measurement. But let's see what happens when you perform measurement. When you perform measurement, 50-50 random. So let's just choose one and then analyze that particular case. Let's choose a plus one, the plus state. What we do we get is wave function all normalized is identity on the first qubit and project to the plus for the second qubit and identity for the third qubit acting on this wave function, okay? So let's compute that. This plus state is a superposition of zero and one, right? One way to analyze this is you have this psi, which is a superposition of zero and one. So one is in the zero, one basis for the second qubit. He's a plus minus basis for the second qubit. So let's just choose one. So I decided to work on the zero, one basis, okay? So. This branch of the wave function, if you act on this projector, what happens is these two parts, first qubit and third qubit, will not be affected because it's identity. However, which project to the plus state, the overlap between the plus state and zero is one over square root two. Okay? So what we get is this will give you one over square root two plus, plus, plus. This plus state, because we have a plus here, this plus, because we have a plus here, this plus, because it's a plus here, and one over square root two, because we have an overlap between this plus and this zero, which is one over square root two, okay? In superposition of this branch, but here, the overlap between plus and one is also one over square root two, so basically, we have the same thing, one over square root two, 
minus plus minus. And then we have overall factor 1 over square root 2 coming from here. Okay? These can be rewritten in the following way. Just pulling out this plus in the middle. This is the same as 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, plus for the first qubit, plus for the third qubit, in superposition of minus for the first qubit and minus for the third qubit, and plus for the second qubit. Okay. So this is not normalized because of the extra 1 over square root 2, and then makes the norm of the wave function, norm squared, to be 1 over 2. That makes sense because of probability is 50-50. But condition on that particular wave function, let's normalize by eliminating this factor. What we find is actually, even though the second qubit is completely disentangled, it's in the product state, actually the first qubit and third qubits are maximally entangled. It's in a bell state, one of the bell states, right? So interestingly, even after the measurement, entanglement of subsystem is still O2. So you perform measurements, you completely disentangle the middle one. However, you do not disentangle subsystem A from the subsystem uh, A prime, uh, a, a, a bar. What's going on? So what's going on is the following. <clears throat> Entanglement is a concept of correlation. So we are talking about how A and A bar are correlated. Here, it's correlated through the middle qubit. When you perform measurements, the environment, or the whatever the person who you know, performs the measurement, is trying to destroy the correlations. However, in quantum mechanics, if you perform measurement in a particular basis, you do not reveal any information about the correlations, and then such information can be protected. And this is precisely the idea of quantum metal correction. Uh, so I need to wrap up in two minutes, so I'll just sketch on it at a high level. Okay. So what is quantum error correction? The quantum error correction is roughly this. Suppose I have some unknown quantum state that I want to protect. How should I do? I bring extra physical ingredient, the degrees of freedom, and then apply some unitary U encoding such a way that even if I throw away some fraction of qubits on the output, in other words, I lose access to them because I lost them, I can still recover information about psi from the remaining ones. Okay? So pictorially, okay, I just throw, you know, throw away, so there's a trash box here and trash box here. Nevertheless, I can apply some kind of decoding unitary so that we, have a, we can recover this psi out. If you can do this for the large fraction of disposal of qubit, it's a good error correcting code because we can protect the information against many, you know, um, a large amount of error, right? So designing good error correcting code is a big deal in quantum information science and in quantum information theory. Here, we are having a particular instance of phenomena where instead of throwing it away, we are performing measurements. And measurement is different from throwing it away because if you measure, you get the measurement outcome, and you know what the measurement outcome is. But throwing it away, you just you, throw, you don't have any access. Still, measurement can be understood as some type of error, because by performing measurement, you collapse the wave function, and this quantum state essentially becomes classical, either zero or one. What it means is any coherence, any superposition associated with this particular qubit is gone, and we only have access to classical information. So some degrees of quantum information is eliminated, but not all information is eliminated because the classical bit, the zero or one, is retained and then you can read it off. So measurement is a special type of error that we can talk about in these specific settings. And what happens is, in random unitary circuits, it's not a competition between entanglement production and entanglement destruction. It is a competition between Entanglement hiding, like encoding, like how, you, how fast can you do this encoding in the random unitary circuit versus how fast you reveal the information by performing the measurement. 
So that took some time to realize in this community uh, <clears throat> uh, where we, we figured that in the generic unitary case, such as random unitary circuit, in fact, this error correcting property emerges naturally. And therefore, this error correcting property is what allows us to have this volume length Engelmann scaling. Yeah, I think the time is up. Like maybe any last questions? Okay, so let me continue on the lecture two um, on a more technical side. Thank you.